Thank you. Thank you. It is uh, great to be here. It's a fantastic occasion and it's, uh, I'm privileged and lucky enough to be here for the second time. So thank you very much for having me. Um, as was introduced, I'm here to talk to you about how do you build the world's most misunderstood brand? How do you shape the world's most misunderstood brand? Now these days, consumers are becoming very savvy. They're very informed. They're becoming resistant to hard sell messages and to traditional advertising tactics. And so brand marketers are aware of this. They're uh, changing their strategies. And lately we've seen a trend towards branded entertainment, branded content in order to deliver messages. Now, this same theory can be applied to a country level as well. But China as a country brand has failed to adopt this strategy as quickly as it probably could have. And it's my contention that if China is able to more rapidly embrace the notion of branded content and branded entertainment, then it'll have much more success in exerting its soft power internationally and building its brand and allowing people to rethink what China really means on an international level. So allow me to explain. What is a brand? Brand is not a logo. It is not a product. It is not a strap line. A brand is the gut feeling that you have about a product or a service or an organization or a person. There are personal brands. There are also country brands as well. What is the gut feeling you have about America? Or Germany for that matter? Or I'm from Australia. What is the first thought that pops in your head? What are the images that are formed in your mind when you think about Australia? And I ask the same question when I say, what do you think about? What is the gut feeling you have when you think about China? That is the brand of China. That is the power of the brand of China. Now, the Chinese government are making an exerted effort to shape your opinion and to frame your perspective of the country. Their goal is to create a strong, positive, and relevant China brand. Now, they're doing this through soft power, through the exertion of soft power. Now, soft power is a term coined by a Harvard professor, Joseph Nye, and he describes it as the ability to attract rather than coerce or use force as a means of persuasion. So, this is not using military. This is not using hard rules and hard approaches to exert your influence, but rather it's about culture and diplomacy and values to gain more influence on the international stage. So why should you build soft power? Why is China interested in actually building soft power? Well, it's a means to success in world politics. And here we have uh, Liu Yunshan, president of the CPC Central Party School, saying that in this modern era, whose culture and values is more widely spread, is able to, have, is able to more effectively influence the world. This has a flow on benefit. More understanding equals more engagement. More engagement equals the benefits, the social benefits, and the economic benefits that come from that as well. So how is China actually building its soft power? What are the steps being taken? Well, it all really started to steamroll ahead in around 2007 when Hu Jintao actually made a statement asserting that soft power was really part of the primary agenda of the, of the, the Politburo, of the China government. Now, China's first big statement was that of the Beijing Olympics. It was China's coming out party of sorts, a statement to say, here we are on the international stage. We're ready to play. Now, there are other platforms that China is using to exert its soft power as well. Xinhua, China's international, now international, news service is actually spreading globally. It's releasing news in several different languages. It's actually bought property in Times Square in the States and has set up an English language satellite network to communicate Chinese news and Chinese points of view across the world as well. Similarly, CCTV, as you all know, is China's TV station. Several different channels they have, including an English language channel. Well, they have several different languages that they're broadcasting internationally as well, having set up a headquarters in Nairobi in Africa and also in Washington to disseminate CCTV new perspective news and China perspectives to an international audience. Diplomacy is another platform in order to exert this power. Now, China's charm offensive, as it's been dubbed, has actually had some pretty powerful impact on the international stage. Some good, some a little questionable, perhaps. But still, this is a tactic used in exertion of the soft power. And then you have, of course, the Confucius Institutes. There are over 300 Confucius Institutes around the world. And their primary goal is to promote the language and the historical culture of China. Now, are these actually effective? Are they working? Well, many would argue yes. There are some that would have a negative opinion. Obviously, with Xinhua and CCTV, the Western perspective might be that this is a government mouthpiece, so it's viewed with a little skepticism. 
diplomacy. There have been some questionable decisions lately, the Syrian veto, um, the issues with Africa as well. So maybe that's not really getting the message out there as effectively as it could as well. So what are these? These are soft power, but a hard sell approach. It's an educational approach to this soft power. It's a policy of education. Whereas the simple fact is a soft sell can actually often be more effective than a hard sell. Now brands already know this and there's been a huge paradigm shift of late as I explained before. Brands are shifting away from the hard sell, pushing product features, putting, pushing facts about products. Rather they're trying to engage with consumers. And this was actually a statement made by Sergio Zyman, former CMO of Coca-Cola 10 years ago, saying that marketing as we know it is actually dead. We need to rethink the way that we approach marketing. Now this applies to brands, why can't it apply for country brands as well? There are some great examples of this kind of branded entertainment, branded content. Red Bull, for example, it doesn't say anything about its products. All it does is it builds interesting content that is a magnet for people, that draws people's attention towards them. One that I'm actually quite fond of is uh, Daft Punk's album's about to drop in a month. Looking forward to that one. Intel have a great project called the Creators Project, which looks into the creative process behind the manufacture or the, the design of, of artistic projects and the albums such as this with Daft Punk and they've been leaking this out in a very effective way. It doesn't say anything about Intel, but it's building this culture of entertainment, branded entertainment. Now this is working. 63% of 16 to 35 year olds actually want brands to entertain them. So can we apply this to China? Well, I think we can, but before, let's have a look at the challenges. What are the challenges that China is actually facing? There are two points of view. Well, actually, there are many, but there are two primary points of view when we look at China from a Western perspective. There's the traditional China of old, and there's the contemporary China of new. Now, if you ask any foreigner, if you could travel overseas, and you say, what do you think of China? Oh, Great Wall, Peking Opera, it's Peking Duck, Beijing Duck. It's the, the, the philosophy behind the culture as well, the ancient philosophy, the mysticism, and of course, Kung Fu, which has always been synonymous with the, with the China brand. Now moving forward into a more modern approach and more modern perception of China, we look at the economic growth that's come over the last 30 years since the opening up with Deng Xiaoping's reforms in 1978. Here we have Shanghai, the city we're in right now, an amazing city, an amazing testament to the growth and the success of the Chinese people. We also have the ubiquitous spokesperson for China, Jackie Chan. He always seems to be, whenever people think of China, think of Jackie Chan. But there are negatives that are attached to China too when you look at it from a Western point of view, even from a local point of view. I live in Beijing. This is not far from where I live. And this is what it looks like, not that inconsistently, unfortunately. Pollution is an issue. Counterfeit trade is an issue. Human rights are also perceived as an issue internationally. Now this is getting pushed by foreign media. They have a bit of a narrow mind of focus. They look at the big stories and the big stories that are important to those are the ones we've just addressed here. So what can, what can China actually do to counter this perception? What steps can they take apart from what's actually going on right now with the, the platforms I listed before? Well, there are a few, but we need to look first at the fact that China is a very proud country with a rich history. You can see this just in the TV. You watch CCTV or any other station for that matter. There are a lot of period dramas. You see the movies. There are a lot of movies that are looking back in time rather than forward or looking at contemporary issues. Very proud culture, but I think it's time that we need to shift out of that focus away from the past. Look at the China of today, the China of tomorrow. What can it bring? What stories can we actually tell? Well, we have much more freedom here in China. We have amazing living standards that have just come from nowhere in such a short amount of time. We have 300 million students learning Chinese. This is a population of America, sorry, learning English. This is phenomenal. We have 67.7 .7 billion spent in ecotech just last year alone. And innovation in green cities such as this proposed city here in Tianjin, looking to house over 350,000 people within the next decade. Innovations that you won't see anywhere else in the world. We have a modern infrastructure that's the envy of the rest of the world. It really is, they've leapfrogged te technology in so many amazing ways. Designers like Ma Yan Song, photographers like Chen Man, artists, Nobel laureates, authors, underground music scene in Beijing. I could go on and on about the amazing things that are happening in China right now that people just simply don't know about. They're seeing one perspective and possibly it's not the right perspective. There are brands that are starting to make their impact known on the international stage, TCL, 
just bought Grassman's Theatre. I work in media, I work in film. This is a big one. They bought Grassman's Theatre in Hollywood, the naming rights at least anyway. They're making their impact felt. They've also sponsored Iron Man 3. These brands are hitting the international stage. These are stories to be told. So if these are the messages that we could be talking about when we're trying to promote China, what's the platform that we should be using to deliver these messages? Is it the Confucius Institute? Is it the Xinhua or CCTV? I don't think so. I think it's film. And I'll tell you why. Hollywood has single-handedly built, or almost single-handedly, digital and technology has had a lot to do with it as well, California into being one of the most powerful economies in the world, the 12th largest economy in the world built on the back of film. And in that process, it's also actually able to disseminate this American culture, this American ideal, and have generations of people around the world look at America with, with, uh, with amaze and interest. I myself actually went to exchange, when I exchanged to America through Rotary in uh, 1994, showing my age now after I finished school. And uh, the primary reason I went to the States is because I've been seeing America on TV, on the movies, watching the movies all the time. I wanted to get my own opinion, shape my own perspective of what it all was, and see it from my own eyes. And that was the power that Hollywood actually had. It can have that same effect for China. Now, it's also the pinnacle of advertising. You look at advertising here, paid media, short form, minimum attention span. It's hard sell. It's not interesting. People are sick of it move up that pyramid to the movies, consumers are paying to watch movies, it's long form entertainment, you're capturing people's attention. It really is the pinnacle of entertainment and of advertising. Let me give you a couple of examples. I'm Australian. Now, Crocodile Dundee has, just by itself, convinced a generation of Americans that we all ride kangaroos to school, okay? <laughs> Maybe not the best myth to be uh, propagating, but nonetheless, it was effective. It built an interest in Australia. The, the trade and the tourism in the 1980s was huge, based on this movie alone. Lord of the Rings has almost single-handedly helped New Zealand to bolster its tourism by a factor of you know, five or six at least. In fact, Air New Zealand are broadcasting Middle Earth as part of their flight safety. You should check that on YouTube, it's quite interesting. So what about China? Well, what are some of the Chinese movies that are helping to shape foreign perspectives of China? Well, going back, we look at Bruce Lee. I remember making some nunchucks out of pieces of steel and string and chasing my dog around the backyard when I saw him doing kung fu. And I'm sure a lot of people were impacted just like, uh, like I was. Moving forward, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, a very powerful movie that had an impact on the West and really shaped perspectives of the West. An interesting perspective based on mysticism and of kung fu as well. So there seems to be a theme going on here. Look at the mummy, maybe not so popular, but still, Eastern mysticism being at the heart here. The Karate Kid, hate the names, the Kung Fu Kid, clearly, not Karate, but still, it's, it's arcing back on these old stereotypes of China, these views of China which are probably not the best views to have. Even Kung Fu Panda, when, you, when you're thinking of China, there seems to be a similar thought process going on. Now, Mission Impossible 3, even Tom Cruise himself would have us believe that Shanghai looks like this. Uh, one thing. What the hell are you doing in Shanghai? I'll tell you when I see you. Now, is this helping to paint the picture of China that we really want the world to know? Is this really helping the situation? Or is it helping to position China and stereotype China in the country that it's not, that it's clearly not? We know that. We live here. We understand what China's all about. Even some of the domestic productions this one that was slated to have global appeal, Zhang Yimou's, a 94 million US dollar budget, grossed 300,000 US in, uh, in uh, the uh, US cinemas, okay? Failed miserably because the content wasn't interesting. And again, it's a period piece. It's going back in time. Why can't we focus on now? Why can't we look forward and show the China of tomorrow? So speaking of film, how is the China film market? Well, there's no surprises here. It's, it's booming, it's going nuts. Here's an index showing the, the box office growth relative between the US and China, and obviously it's skyrocketing. This is uh, now a $2.7 billion industry, second largest in the world, 30% year-on-year growth. Projections are that this is potentially going to take over America within this decade, possibly by 2018, which is phenomenal. And so, of course, this is raising the interest of everyone in America and in Hollywood. They're thinking, how do they get a piece of this? How do they capture this? Almost 10 screens being built per day in China. 10 cinema screens being built per day in China. This is fact. 
13 and a half thousand screens at the moment, projected to be 35,000 screens by 2016, the CFG official figures. 64 foreign, foreign movies are screened here in China each year. But of those 64 foreign movies, only 34 actually get a percentage of the box office back. So if you're a studio in America, you'll only receive a percentage of the box office if you're one of those 34, otherwise you don't. So everyone's clamoring to be one of those 34 movies, which makes it very, very competitive unless America decides to engage with China and do it in a meaningful way, rather than just trying to sell its movies to China. How about a bit of interaction with China as well? There's some interesting ways that this can actually happen. Here is uh, the director of Avengers, Joss Whedon, talking about Avengers 2. I'm working on the script right now, and if someone came to me and said, we're looking at doing chunks of this in China, well, I'd have to think about it. China is on my radar. It can't not be at this point. So what does this mean? It means that Hollywood is making movies that have China-relevant content. It's actually making movies with China as well. For example, Looper, production shared between DMG Entertainment and Endgame out of Hollywood. This was actually originally supposed to be set in France, but it was re-scripted to include China. It's set in the future, and it showcases a Shanghai of tomorrow. Here is an amazing city, as it could be in the future, showing how China could potentially be. Iron Man 3 being released very soon. Again, a, a production between DMG Entertainment and Marvel Studios. Now, this was partly shot in China. It has China-relevant content. We have Wang Shui-Chi standing, standing in front of Yong Ho Gong in Beijing. And what it actually does is it positions China as being an innovation leader. The technology that China has invented and the Chinese doctor save Iron Man 3 and save Tony Stark's life. Now, this is actually painting a positive picture of China moving forward. It's not looking back in time. It's looking at now. It's looking at where China could be going. This is powerful. Now, the power of brands and the power of pushing brands through film hasn't been lost on products for a long, long time. Even since the 1930s all the way through, there are examples of where Hollywood has been a vehicle for promotion of products. So it's my assertion that China can really make the most of this particular situation as well. It has an amazing opportunity to build its country brand through film, and ironically, by using Hollywood film. By looking at the fact that Hollywood has an interest in producing and capitalizing on the market here, and China has an interest in communicating its brand internationally as well. So if this is done correctly, you're going to start seeing a lot more movies with China content in it, and you're going to start seeing movies that have a positive China a futuristic China, not one that looks backwards, but one that looks forwards. In either case, get used to it, because China is definitely here to stay. Thank you very much.